Hey, I'm Pastor Justin, and I want to welcome you to worship with the City Life Church online. Every week, countless people worship right here on this platform from regions all over the 757 and all over the world. And they keep coming back because worshiping online can be a powerful experience when you keep a few things in mind. One, ditch distraction. Put your devices on Do Not Disturb. Lock it in to all God is doing in every moment. Two, get active in the chat. Whether it's greeting others, typing an amen to a song or a sermon point, or throwing an emoji or three in there. And lastly, share the link online so others can join. It's a simple act that can make a major impact in somebody's life. Because that's what we know. God wants to impact each one of us tonight as we pursue him together. So let's do just that, starting right now in our worship. Good evening, City Life Church. Come on, why don't you stand to your feet tonight? If you're here in the sanctuary or if you're at home, we're so grateful that you've decided to join us tonight. I was glad when they said it to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We are so grateful that you are here tonight. Is anybody grateful and excited to just be here in the house of the Lord on another amazing Saturday night? Father, we pray that you would have your way in this place, that you would be glorified through our worship, not just our song, but the offering of our life that we would give you tonight. And we pray that you get the glory out of our life and we'll give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, somebody lift your voice and shout to the Lord. Amen.
and tell them about the goodness of God and we'll be back with more times of worship in just a few more moments. City Life Church, we are so excited to have you here tonight. We want to invite you to come on back down into your seats if you're chatting. And then if you're watching online, all of those conversations you might be having in the chat, bring it on in. We're so glad to see you here tonight. If uh, this is your first time, your second time, your third time, we especially welcome all of our guests and visitors. Church, can we give it up for all those people? who are visiting tonight. 
It's not easy to be a stranger in a room, and so we just appreciate that. We appreciate you coming to check us out. We appreciate the time that you're giving to the service tonight, and it's our prayer that as you're here tonight, that you will experience, encounter the presence of God. We know and we believe as a church, right, that God still speaks. Uh, he's doing it right here in person at 311 Selden Road, uh, but he's also doing it as you're listening to uh, this service online. If you're watching us in your car, in your living room, wherever you might be, we believe, come on, that God is able and he does meet us on Saturday nights as we worship him. So we pray. It's our prayer that nobody leaves here tonight without encountering the presence of God, without hearing his voice, without seeing how he's moving in your life. And we hope that that is happening for you. And we hope too, especially for our visitors, that it's easy for you to connect not only with, with God himself in worship, but also with his body, the church. Um, and so we try to make it as easy as we possibly can. So there is uh, a, a number that you can text. You just text that word guest that you see there uh, to that number on the screen, and it just gives us the opportunity to meet you. Uh, you fill out a little survey that gives us some basic information about yourself, and then we'll give you a call or shoot you a text and uh, we can just answer all the questions that you might have about the church and help you to plug in here um, so that you find your place at City Life or wherever uh, a church that's right for you if you're uh, visiting the area or looking for one around here. So we're so grateful that you're with us. We hope that you choose to take your next steps with us. And um, for those of you who are here tonight who are not guests, those of you who call City Life your, your, your church home, um, if you are part of the City Life family, we do want to just let you know that there is a building workday coming up. Uh, there was one, thank you, whoever clapped and was excited about pulling weeds. Come on now. <laughs> I told you God is here. See, like he, because I'm not, I'm not a clapping about uh, pulling weeds unless the Holy Spirit prompts me to do so. Um, but anyway, we do have a building work day coming up. If you remember, we were announcing that back in April, but you know what they say, April showers bring May flowers. It got rained out, um, and so we pushed it back to May, and we're praying that it doesn't rain this time. It's May 25th, uh, 5 to 8. There will be pizza. Come on, somebody. That's something to clap about. Uh, there will be pizza. There will be snacks and food. It'll be a great opportunity to connect with people. But also, uh, especially a great opportunity to steward this building. And so if maybe you're newer to the church, uh, you might not know uh, the, the, the testimony of this building. For a long time, City Life Church, we lived a kind of a nomadic life. And so we were in movie theaters and uh, we were meeting in different campuses and kind of renting at different places. But just a few uh, years ago, a, another church, the previous owners of this building, gifted us this multi-million dollar building. Um, to to use. And so we are doing that, and not only us, but a bunch of other churches that we're partnering with who use it on Sundays for services and throughout the week for their meetings and for their office spaces, um, different ministries even in the area. So this building is a blessing. It's a blessing to us, and it's a blessing to all the people, the churches, the ministries that we partner with. And so by you coming out, helping us to pull those weeds, helping us to clean up uh, uh, the facilities, it uh, is an opportunity for us to be good stewards of that good gift that God gave us. And so we just want to invite you to do that. Another way that we all get to be good stewards of this physical space that God has given us is, is through our tithes, is through our offerings. And so we just want to remind you that it's easy to do that. Uh, you can just go to the link that you see there on the screen. Uh, if you're watching online, I think you can click a, a, a give button. Uh, if you're here in person and you'd rather uh, put a physical check in a, an actual offering basket, the old school way, we have those at either one of our entrances. But it's just another opportunity for you to uh, help us to steward this building uh, and, and it, through your actual uh, financial giving. And so we just were, wanted to remind you of that. So church, we're so glad that you're here tonight. We pray that God continues to speak and move as he's already begun to do. And uh, we hope that you enjoy the rest of tonight's service. Welcome to City Life. Our dream is that there will be no other place on the planet where Jesus is easier to find than the 757. So if you are in person or watching online and feel far from God, our prayer is that you find Jesus here tonight. Be sure to check out our events promo page on our website for all that's happening in the life of our church.
A bet is something that many of us take for granted. That feeling of crawling under the covers after a long day. There's nothing like it. But what if you don't have a bed to crawl into at night? This is the sad reality for over 300 kids right here in our city. And we plan to get in the game and help meet this need this summer. City Life Church and Lifehouse are partnering with Sleep in Heavenly Peace to build a minimum of 53 beds so that more kids can do just that, sleep on a bed. And through meeting this necessary and practical need, we at City Life are striving to build a continuing and growing relationship that will allow us the opportunity to make Jesus easy to find in this aqueduct community. So how can you help? Through the month of May, our focus will be fundraising for this July 30th bed build event. It costs $250 to provide a full bed setup for a child, and that's everything from pillows to bed frames. Every donation matters and gets us closer to our goal of getting at least 53 kids off the floor. We'll work hard and play hard with a block party the day of the build in the Aqueduct community. To give to this life-giving project, follow the instructions on the bottom of the screen and feel free to get your friends and workplaces involved through sponsoring a bed or showing up to serve. Isn't it awesome that God includes us in His plans to provide for others? He loves the people of our city more than we can imagine, and He invites us to be His hands, His feet, and His presence through meeting this practical need in our community. So, church, get in the game, and let's raise that money to get the kids off the floor in our community. Ladies of City Life, what a year, and it's time to come back together to be revived. I am so excited to invite each one of you to attend our annual Revive Women's event. This will be a time to be refreshed, revitalized, reinvigorated, reconnected, given new strength and energy for all that God has in store for each one of us. Revive 2022 will be happening on Friday evening, June 10th, and Saturday morning, June 11th, right here at our City Life campus and virtually. Friday night will be a time of pouring into as we celebrate and worship together. Saturday morning will include a session with our guest speaker, Pastor Tanya Fehrenbach from Life Church in Williamsburg, and intimate breakout sessions where we will unpack in practical ways what it means to amplify God's voice, making it the loudest. We will finish strong on Saturday night as we gather with our entire City Life family for our closing session. This amazing time together is going to be completely free, but we are asking that you register to let us know how you plan to attend, whether in person or online. You can register by texting the word REVIVE to the number on the screen. So ladies, get these dates on your calendar, grab a couple of girlfriends and join us at REVIVE 2022. You do not want to miss this. Hey church, we're kicking off the summer with a party in the parking lot. Saturday, June 4th, immediately following our service, plan to stick around and hang out with your church family right here. You can bring your own dinner, have it delivered, or even pick up from someplace close by. Plus, we're gonna have free Pelican snow for anybody who wants it. It's gonna be an awesome opportunity to reconnect with people, meet some new faces, and grow deeper in relationship with your church family. We cannot wait to see you there. If you have any questions about our church, visit citylifeva.com or email us at info at citylifeva.com. Thanks for sharing your Saturday with us. Together, let's make Jesus easy to find. Church, I invite you to stand back up to your feet. Some of y'all are already standing already. I mean, y'all excited to get back in, into this encounter tonight in the presence of the Lord. We are so grateful for you doing that tonight. Father, so with our hands lifted up tonight, we say, Father, please come and invade our room, invade our spaces, wherever we are. We know that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we pray that liberty would be in our homes where we're watching from, that liberty would be here in this sanctuary. For we know that when you show up, everything changes, Father. So we give you permission now to come into the room of our heart, come into the four walls of this room. And we promise we're going to give you praise tonight. We're going to respond to your presence tonight in a very strong and tangible way. So, Father, open our spirits to, to hear from you tonight. And we pray that you would rush in this room like a mighty wind. And we will give you praise and honor for it. Somebody come on and lift your voice and clap your hands with us as we sing about the rushing in power of Jesus Christ. You're right. 
But the Spirit of the Lord is very strong in this place. And I challenge you tonight, don't be reserved. Don't be passive tonight. But the fountain of the living God is in this room. And if you need to be filled again, you can be refilled again. Don't let your physical flesh and your mental preferences keep you from receiving from God tonight. There is a fountain that's flowing tonight in this room. And if you're ready to be filled with that fountain of living water, somebody raise up your hands now. Ooh, and just ask the Lord, say, fill me again. Come on, open your mouth, City Life Church, even online. Put that in the chat. Say, fill me again. 
Fill me again with your spirit. Fill me again with your power. For you are the only thing that can satisfy. You, can, you are the only thing that can fill the void that's in our lives. So many people are searching for answers in this season. They're searching for, for voids to be filled. And we've tried to fill it with things of this world. But just as we've sung, the Lord and the Father on in heaven has an unlimited supply of resource and a limited supply of healing and joy and thanksgiving that he's ready to give us tonight. That he's ready to give us tonight. So with uplifted hands and with our hearts lifted toward the Father, we say you are the only one that can satisfy us. We are satisfied with you, Jesus. You've done enough for us on the cross that you don't have to do another thing else. But you are the only one that satisfies us, Lord. So with our hands lifted, with our mouths open, we say, Father, we celebrate you and we are, ooh, we're satisfied with you. We don't want the things of this world, but all we want is more of you. Anybody come tonight wanting more of the Father? I ask again, is anybody in this room come tonight that wants more of the Father? Ooh, we want more of you. And we know that as long as we stay empty, as long as we stay available, he'll fill us tonight. So, Father, you are the only one that can satisfy us. We are satisfied with you and you alone. Yeah. You are the only one that satisfies our heart. You are the only one that satisfies our soul. Ooh, so we lift up our voices of thanksgiving to you now. And we say thank you for being the one that fills us. Thank you for being the one that satisfies us. Ooh, you are Jesus. And we honor you. Cause only you can satisfy my heart. Only you can satisfy my soul. Only you can satisfy my heart. It's Jesus. Jesus. Only you can satisfy. You know it. My heart. If you're satisfied with Jesus today, let him know that you're available. Let him know that you're open for his leading tonight. Only you can Who do we know? Well, let's sing this song to him. Only you can satisfy. We take time to let you know how much you mean to us. Only you can world has offered I'll have to come again again and again with just one drink of his living water I'll never thirst again I'll never thirst again you say, only you can satisfy well, raise up your song raise up your song only you can satisfy Raise up your heart now. my soul. Oh, only you can, you can satisfy You're the only one. my heart. Jesus. Jesus. Let's put some weight in the room. Jesus. Say only you.
Trusting. Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. We've sang it enough. Let them sing it, church. Say, only you can. the posture he's been longing for. Come on, let's raise it again. You raise your voice, church. Say, holy. as we call out to Jesus, I feel like he just wants to remind us of something we were singing not too long ago, that God doesn't discriminate. He doesn't discriminate because we're singing about the well, we're singing about wells and living water and just thinking, you know, the image of the well was drawn to John 4, the Samaritan woman. Just those two words were reasons somebody in that culture could discriminate. And he starts talking to her and she's taken aback because not only is this a man talking to a woman, it's a Jew talking to a Gentile. She's thinking in her head, why would he be speaking to me? 
And maybe tonight that's your perspective. Why would God speak to me? Why would God draw near to me? Why would God be interested in my life? You know what's powerful about that story is at the very end, she runs off to the village, her friends, that town, and says, he told me everything I ever did. Because I think what sometimes holds us back is we're like, well, if he knew what my week was like, if he knew what this last month, what my life has been like up to this point in its totality, he wouldn't, he wouldn't want anything to do with me. And yet he knew everything this woman had ever done, and he wanted to speak to her and offer her living water. And he does the same for us tonight. And we sing about Jacob and his well, and in Genesis, <laughs> there's an account where he wakes up and he's like, wow, surely God was here, and I wasn't aware of it. And maybe you've been holding back tonight. Maybe you know Chris has been exhorting us to raise our hands and clap and shout. And maybe you've just been holding back. But, man, I pray that tonight, Holy Spirit, you would awaken us to your voice. You would awaken us to your presence. You would awaken us to your living water. That you, you say, like John 7, 37, I believe, come and drink. God, I pray that we would all hear that, that beckoning to come. God, to, to enter into your presence, even as we're exiting worship, God, you're not leaving this place. God, I pray that we would press in, press into your word, and Holy Spirit, I pray that you would use it to give us a clearer picture of you, give us a clearer picture of what Jesus did on the cross for us and the way you see us. God, I pray that we would, we would walk out of here assured that you do not discriminate. God, that your love flows from that cross to all of us in this place. And God, we embrace you we pursue you. God, Holy Spirit, use your word tonight as only you can. We don't want to come to a TED talk or some nice talk. God, we want your Holy Spirit to change our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. I've sufficiently sweat through my clothes worshiping, so if I black out preaching, Chris, you can take us out. <laughs> But welcome tonight, whether you are here in person, whether you're joining us online from anywhere in the 757 or anywhere in the world, I'm simply honored that you would take your Saturday evening to be with us as we praise Jesus for all he's done and pursue God for all we know he's going to do, not just tonight, but moving forward through his church. And if you're a note taker, I like to take notes when I'm being, sitting under a sermon. If you're a note taker, you can simply put the title of the series we're in, The Story. And you can put a little subtitle. Because uh, tonight the, the title is Eternal Life, and you can put dot, 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 is now in session. We're going to study eternal life tonight, and it is now in session. But I want to give a special shout out to Pastor Vanessa, who gave that incredible word last week on faithfulness. Right, set the stage for Mother's Day weekend. I hope you all had a, a, a fantastic weekend celebrating all the moms and all the women in your life. <laughs> but I don't know, if you, if you went through a week like I just went through, sometimes Mother's Day already feels like it was like a month ago. That feels pretty far off in the rear view. And then you talk about a month ago, Easter, that feels like a lifetime ago, right? That seems like forever ago because we are marching through our calendars, right? Our focus is set forward on, on what's to come, right? We're already thinking, all right, June, we got Juneteenth, we got Father's Day, then we got July 4th. And then right after that, before you know it, they're going to be selling costumes in Target and Walmart. Then there's Thanksgiving. And before Thanksgiving is even over, they have the Christmas stuff set out. Right? We are so good at <laughs> anticipating and the build up to our celebrations in our culture. But we're so conditioned to move quickly from one to the next that sometimes we miss the, the contemplation and reflection that should come with them. And Raj recently found this out the hard way. See, uh, Raj is obsessed with eggs. Uh, not just the, the kind of Easter eggs you can open, but even these, those aren't real eggs because that would be madness. Those are eggs you're supposed to like paint and decorate, but he found them in the pantry. He's like, no, nah, this is good. I like these eggs. He is obsessed with eggs. Why is he still obsessed with eggs on May 14th? <laughs> well, what had happened was <laughs> I go on uh, long runs with Raj on Saturday and Sunday, and we always stop at the park on the way home so he can like stretch his legs after I've destroyed mine. And, and uh, so the Sunday before Easter, Palm Sunday, that morning, I go for a run. We stop at this park. We're the only people there, Raj and I. And we're looking around, and there are hundreds of Easter eggs all around. So Raj is like, all right, bet. <laughs> Raj, you know, he's picking them up. And what's great, though, is Raj, when he picks up Easter eggs, he wants to open them, which if you ever saw him open eggs, maybe at the Easter egg hunt, he steps on them till it pops open, right? Practical. And then he'll pick it up. And he'll give it to you, and he wants you to put it back in there, close it again, and then he would put it back where he found it on the park. And this is key, and this is good, because about five minutes, ten minutes later, a family showed up with four kids. Apparently, they are super parents, A-plus, world-class parents, and they had set up an Easter egg hunt at this park for their four children. 
Yeah, right? Awesome. I was like applauding them. This is awesome. And they were all cool because Roger just put the eggs back anyways. <laughs> there was no conflict. But then Steph and I went to that park with Raj twice that week leading up to Easter. And Steph is also an A-plus mom. Uh, and so she would pack like a half dozen and maybe a dozen Easter eggs for Raj to find. And again, he's just picking them up and putting them back. So when he puts them back, I just go hide it again. So it was like infinite eggs for Raj. But see, what happened was he began to associate eggs with the park. So you know what happened that, that first week after Easter? We stop at that park, and he, he has a DEFCON 5 nuclear meltdown that there are no eggs at this park. Meltdown for uh, 20, 30 minutes, just freaking out that there were no eggs. And even just after time, right, a few more times, there would be times where he'd be like, eggs, eggs, because I stop at the end of the run, I'd be like, no, nah, there's no eggs here. So he'd just sit back in the stroll and say, home. The, the park had Ecclesiastes level of meaningless. Everything is meaningless because there were no eggs at the park for him to find. See, Raj was getting a taste of our culture and how quickly we can move on from our celebrations. Once Easter weekend is over, the Easter egg hunt is done, Easter service is over, all right, let's move on to the next thing. We'll see you next year. Pack it up. And it's not just our calendars and our holidays. Think about our social media feeds for a second. We will bounce from gossip to tragedy, to mindlessness over here, back to outrage and back to gossip within moments of each other. We'll skim our feeds on a micro scale, but we also skim through our calendars on a macro scale, often not really taking the time to pause and consider and reflect. And if you do that, even get to maybe some application and some transformation. And I share all this because as humans, our minds are like this ceaseless flow of awareness and mindfulness. And what we're mindful of will affect us. And I say this because to be constantly mindful of Easter's reality, right, Christ's resurrection, Christ beating death in the grave and his eternal life offered to us right now, that will save us from many of our daily worries, daily regrets, daily frustrations, but we oh so quickly pivot off of it. But I share that because as I've hopped on to, you know, the next things on my calendar, I want to look at the church calendar. Not City Life's calendar, you're not going to find that online, I'm talking about the liturgical calendar. You know, we plan for Easter for weeks, and it's over after the service. But on the liturgical calendar, we sit squarely in the middle of Easter tide season. Now, in the original church calendar, that's 40 days. It marks the days that Jesus was resurrected before his ascension. But even in Western culture, we've extended it 10 more days to go to Pentecost Sunday and the celebration of Pentecost, a 50-day reflection on Easter. And while we don't formally celebrate Easter Tide here, I would say this, this series we're in, the story about the story of the Bible and, and the redemptive and resurrective story that God is writing, that we have a part to play in, it's a beautiful way to reflect on that again and again in its reality for us. And tonight we're going to dig in, as I said, to eternal life. Eternal life in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. That reads, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, we've been in this series, the story, for some time on Easter. Jesus, Jesus preached through Pastor Fred? Pastor Fred preached about the promise Jesus made to prepare a place for us and the promises Jesus makes and how we can trust in those promises. The week after that, he preached on uh, the comparative experience of earth and heaven, and he touched on celestial beings and angels and demons and seraphim and cherubim and the heavenly realms and all these pictures we get in scripture of those heavenly realms. And we're going to continue that tonight, sort of, <laughs> in a way. Because think about how we traditionally think of heaven. When you start talking about heaven, when you start considering heaven, the picture we often get in our head, it's like pearly gates, streets of gold, health restored, you're, you're reunited with loved ones, you got new Jerusalem, all these different things that we think about and so on. And Easter and salvation for many has become Jesus punching our ticket into this heaven to come. We celebrate the resurrection because we too one day will be resurrected and ushered into heaven and praise God for that. But I'm also thirsty for a God and an eternal life that will impact the here and now. Anybody feel me? Like I got brokenness, you know, we talk about health restored, we got broken health that we could use healing in today, right? I got broken relationships that I could use God's help with today. I got brokenness in my life that I would love for God to minister to today. See, this perspective sometimes of us punching our ticket for a resurrection to come doesn't affect the land of the living as much as it affects the end of our living. 
But this is a limited perspective of salvation and eternal life. Because eternal life, it's not just about living forever in heaven. Like I think we get, like heaven is where God is. But if we die, we go to heaven with the streets of gold, the pearly gates, all the good stuff, to live eternally. And Jesus isn't there. Is that eternal life? Right? Is, is there more to eternal life in Scripture than living into eternity? And tonight I want to look deeply at Romans 6.23 alongside some moments and parallel statements in the ministry of Jesus that speak to eternal life. I want to dive into some possible misconceptions that I know sometimes I drift into. We're all probably guilty of drifting into and the harm that they can do. Because I said earlier that the benefits of reflecting on the resurrection and Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, there's also misconceptions come with a cost, right? What's distorted can derail you. Be it the depth of eternal life you walk in personally or the impact we have, not just personally, but corporately as the church. But to, to jump in tonight, three different perspectives about eternal life. The first is eternal life as transactional versus relational. See, Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, wages speaks to earning. It's a transaction, goods for hard labor. The message version says work hard for sin your whole life and your pension is death. That's a raw deal. But here it says the wages of sin is death, but the wages of righteous living is eternal life. Only it doesn't say that. Good job not saying amen. <laughs> But I say it like that because so often this is the perspective we drift into, that the wages of righteous living is eternal life, that, that somehow God's love or eternal life is given according to our righteous living. But Paul holds up this juxtaposition, right? He, he points to the opposite of earned wages, a gift. Or some translations put it plainly, others have a footnote, it is a free gift. This is why the good news of the gospel is good news, right? We all have sinned. And fallen short. None of us have lived a righteous and perfect life. And yet while we were still sinners, before we could even have an inkling of a thought of trying to even have a relationship with this perfect God, Jesus died for us to open the door to that relationship, to eternal life. The creator and giver of life took on flesh to die so that we could have life eternal. And yet having been told this, I know again and again in my own life, it's still so easy to drift into trying to earn it. And I think part of it it's just the American dream and the American culture we're in where we want to pull ourselves up in our own strength. Nobody wants a handout, right? We want to earn it. We want to point to it and say, I did that. So we can so easily operate with the perspective that we are more acceptable or less acceptable to God based on what we do or don't do. So Jesus, in this case, he becomes an example, a helper, a teacher, but no longer a savior. And sometimes, sometimes this life of moralism keeps people from finding Jesus altogether. Not just in our day and age here in America, I'm talking about in Israel when Jesus walked the earth in flesh and blood. Paul points to this in, in Romans 9 where he says, how could they miss what God was doing? Because instead of trusting God, they took over. They were absorbed in what they themselves were doing. They were so absorbed in their God projects that they didn't notice God right in front of them, like a huge rock in the middle of the road. You see it in the Gospels. The religious leaders themselves and the people they taught, they pursued holiness. They pursued relationship with God through some 613 laws that they had built up about how to keep the Sabbath, right? How to, how to observe the Sabbath, dietary restrictions, how to set the bar, the 613 laws to what is somehow sufficient for pleasing God, somehow, somehow necessary and sufficient. And they were so busy striving in this way to be holy that when the holy and righteous one took on flesh and was present before them, they missed it. And when they did engage with Jesus in religious discussions, it was often questions like, how do I punch my ticket into your kingdom? How do I get into eternal life? It's summarized in the question that the rich young ruler, as we know him, asks in Matthew 19, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life, right? To, to obtain, purchase eternal life. What do I have to do we don't have time to read the story in full, but it basically echoes the aching question that the Israelites had been wrestling with for so long. How do I earn it? How do I punch my ticket into the coming kingdom? But see, Jesus, throughout the Gospels, he doesn't define eternal life as a transaction in the future. No, he defines it as a relationship in the present. Jesus says elsewhere in John 17, 3, explicitly, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, 
and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. See, we don't have to wait to get to a destination for eternal life because Jesus came here. He opened the door to relationship with God through the cross. But see, for Israel, at the time of Jesus to hear this, that's like a lofty aspiration because they couldn't just walk into the temple, open the door, and push their way into the Holy of Holies like, here I am. <laughs> no, by God's very design to promote a fear of God, there was a veil, a big old veil, 30 feet by 30 feet, some say four inches thick. I'm talking about like a phone book that would, that would separate people from just walking into the presence of God. Because there is a healthy realization. No, no, this is the presence of God. And yet at the moment of Christ's death, it says, when you read the scriptures, that at the moment of his death, this veil tore, this four-inch thick veil. Like, what was the old strong guys that used to go around ripping phone books? Like, this is that on steroids, right? <laughs> a 30-foot veil from the top, as if God was doing it himself, saying, no, 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 you have open access. Hebrews 10, 20 paints this beautiful picture of how Jesus opened the veil so we have access to relationship with God. But you know what? I think the devil, the enemy, he's like a, a wretched interior designer. He likes to put up new veils, right? He likes to put up the veil that tells us we have to earn it. He likes to put up the veil that eternal life and relationship with God is transactional and we have to pay up for it. He likes to put up the veil that says, even if Jesus paid for it, it was 2,000 years ago, and, and, and eternal life ain't going to happen until heaven, so you it's got nothing to do with your life right now. But eternal life is not transactional. It's relational. This is eternal life, that we know the one true God in Jesus Christ whom he sent. That means it's open season on eternal life. Or as the theologian and author Dallas Willard said, and we wrote down earlier, eternal life is now in session. Eternal life is not just about quantity. It's not just about length. It's about quality and depth. There's a depth of life God wants us to experience, starting in this life. I love Isaac Watts. He once wrote in his hymn, The Hill of Zion Yields. It says, the hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets before we reach the heavenly fields or walk the golden streets. A thousand sacred sweets this side of heaven might sound odd, but it calls to mind for me the, the message version of 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, which says the spirit of God whets our appetite by giving us a taste of what's ahead. And all of this just reminds me of a verse that's been central to our church for years, decades even, Psalm 27, 13, where David said, I, I believe I'm going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. He wasn't just biding his time, waiting for some life with God to start in heaven. No, he believed that he could experience God's goodness, his presence in the land of the living. See, God isn't waiting for eternity to begin. God has existed and does exist in eternity right now. And he's opening the door to relationship with him, knowing him and Jesus, who he sent. But for many, again, we live behind this veil that salvation and saving faith and eternal life is transactional. And in this transaction, we often wrestle with, okay, what's the minimum admission fee? Like the, the rich young ruler and, and, the, and the religious leaders are like, okay, what's the, what's the, the price I got to pay, the, the minimum requirement to, to get into heaven? And how many of you know a, a minimum, finding the minimum might work when you're like bartering a transaction? But it doesn't work in relationships. Don't try this with your spouse or your girlfriend or your loved one. You know, what, what's, the, what's the minimum amount of dating you think we can do and keep the flame alive, right? What's the lowest level of commitment you're comfortable with? Or what's the minimum amount of exclusivity we got when it comes to, like, interacting with the, the opposite sex? Where's the line I can cross and I'm, I'm still good? And where's the line I can cross and it's too far? See, we grasp this with our relationships with others, right? Steph is laughing because that's ridiculous. And yet, how often do we ask these questions about where the line is with God in our relationship with him? How often do we toe the line, like how far can I go, rather than pressing in to relationship with him and the transformation that comes through that relationship? See, that whole idea of where's the line or the boundary points to the second perspective on eternal life, a perspective of eternal life as a centered set versus a bounded set. Now, I'll explain that, but... I just use the example of a marriage relationships. And, and, and marriages survive and thrive when we never stop pursuing the other person, right? <laughs> if you live with the perspective that you reached the finish line in your romantic relationship when you, when you made that vow at the altar, your marriage is doomed. <laughs> that is not the finish line. That's the starting line, right? And it is never a finish line. I'm going to learn more about Steph and, and what makes her happy and what hurts her and how I can better love her till the day we die, right? It doesn't have a finish line. How much more with an infinite God, an eternal God? 
But we often live with the perspective of eternal life and, and a relationship with God that operates from a bounded set. Again, what is that? Bounded sets and centered sets were first introduced in the field of psychology to understand social structure. And so a, a bounded set is described like a fence, the boundary. And a centered set is described like a well. Come on. When we started singing these songs, how many songs did we sing about wells? And I was like, the Holy Spirit setting up something, because I didn't tell Chris I was preaching on this. But yeah, a centered set is described as a well. I think there's a, 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 a ranching saying where it's like, uh, there's two ways to keep cattle on a ranch. I'm going to butcher it. Uh, one is to build a fence. The other is to build a well. See, the bounded set is defined by boundaries. And it's largely static, because once you're in, you're in. But a, a, a centered set is defined by what's at the center. And it's marked by dynamic movement as one continues to press towards whatever is in the center. See, one is concerned with boundaries and the other is concerned with what is at the center. The rich young ruler's question was from a bounded set. He's like, what I got to do to step in, cross that boundary into the kingdom and eternal life? And Jesus' his concern was central. Who's at the center of your life? For that rich young ruler, we find out what's at the center of his heart was wealth. For many of the Pharisees and religious rulers, not all of them, but for many of them, the center of their heart was power. But both desperately wanted to be insiders, having crossed the line into God's kingdom and look on other people like, like they were outsiders. And what drove them up the wall again and again in conversations with Jesus and how he acted is sometimes he implied that those who saw themselves as insiders might actually be on the outside. And some of those people they saw as sinners and, and outsiders Actually, we're getting in before them. See, we see eternal life in a relationship in the gospel. We see it through Jesus' teaching. It is a centered set. Jesus and his holiness are at the center, and we're called to forever press in. So in the same way, salvation isn't a one-time moment or exchange for many at an altar that we then walk away from. It's a posture of faith centered on Christ that you begin in that moment and continue for the rest of your life. Y'all can remember this. Sobering conversation with a young man. I won't get specific, but he was in college. I'd known him since he was in middle school. And he was just giving an account of what college was like. And he knows I'm a pastor, so it became like a moment of confession. He's like, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing this. He didn't like that he was doing it. He knew it was wrong. But at the same time, he said, when he went back, he'd probably keep doing it. You know what he said? <laughs> there was that one time I, I prayed that prayer at the altar, so I'm good, right? See, what's tragic is he was operating from the same perspective of the rich young ruler. Have I, have, haven't I crossed over the line where Jesus was anywhere but the center? Salvation in, in their minds. Salvation in their minds had become a boundary to cross, an entrance to walk through, where further progress at that point is optional. Because once you're in, you're in. There's no pole to greater depth. See, the, the cost of this perspective, this bounded set, it isn't just what we see in their lives, but growth and transformation goes out the window. Eternal life doesn't affect us right now. You know, there was a Barna study nearly a decade ago where they, I forget the number of people they surveyed, but it was a lot in our country. And they found that half of the adults had prayed a prayer of salvation. Half of them. A prayer many of them had moved on from as they began to ask them about spiritual disciplines and what they were doing, and only a small fraction of them were practicing any of it. See, a prayer for them had been something that they'd walked away from. And eternal life was something down the road that really didn't affect any of the living they were doing right now. Didn't affect the posture of their life and the impact they were having for God. Again, when we operate with this perspective, that salvation is just punching our ticket to heaven. Once we've punched our ticket to heaven, we start clocking out on earth, right? But here's the problem. We aren't just called to punch our ticket to heaven. God's concern isn't some distant stepping into heaven. He wants to get heaven into us so we can get heaven into the world. Not just transforming us, but transforming and renewing the world around us, right? Jesus teaches us to pray, thy will be done. <laughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But how many of you know you shouldn't ask if you're not ready to act? <laughs> and he intends for us to usher in the kingdom of heaven and do that work. Like just briefly, in heaven, there's perfect peace. So that's why we work for peace here on earth. In heaven, there's perfect justice. That's why we work towards justice here on earth. And so on and so forth, we fight. We praise, we build, we pray, we advocate, we worship, we sing songs, we do all these things. It's an active faith that keeps pressing onward and pressing inward. Living with a centered set that produces growth. Growth doesn't happen in a bounded set where once you're in, 
you're in, and growth is optional. So maybe you've been approaching your faith like it's a bounded set rather than a centered one. You've crossed some boundary, and now you're set. Like you prayed a prayer, and you've sputtered in your pursuit. Maybe you feel stale, uninspired. Maybe you need to stop, start operating from a centered set. And I would encourage you, if that's you tonight, these books are in the back. They're free. They're like 50 pages. You can read this in one sitting over a cup of coffee. And Pastor Fred wrote it, and he talks about the 12 pathways, right, 12 spiritual disciplines we'll walk in if we're following Christ. He talks about 24 virtues that will grow in us as we walk in those pathways. And here's the thing. I'll be growing in those things till the day I die. There's never going to be a day where I wake up or go to bed, mind you, at the end of the day. It's like, well, I was Christ-like today <laughs> perfectly. Mm -mm. That's, that's not going to happen. And that may sound daunting, like you're not going to ever arrive. But you know what I find encouraging? <laughs> As I was reading the Bible this week, Jesus' first words, among his first words, to his disciple Peter were, follow me. And then again, among his last words, <laughs> on the earth, to Peter, follow me. You know what that tells me? I'm never going to stop following. I'm never going to stop pursuing. Not because Jesus doesn't want to be fine or he's hard to find, but because he's eternal. <laughs> and my relationship with him, eternal life is marked by relationship with him. But before we hit on the, the third perspective tonight, just to kind of tie the two together. You know, I think the reason we lean into, I'm guilty of leaning into, right, this transactional perspective or, or a, a bound set for salvation is because we want assurance. We want assurance of salvation, right? We, we want some measure to be sure of. We want a receipt on our proof of purchase. We want to be able to hold up a receipt. So why does the rich young ruler ask Jesus how to punch his ticket into eternal life? Because he wanted assurance of salvation. And here's what I love. Jesus doesn't scoff at him. Jesus doesn't frown at him. Jesus doesn't laugh at him. No, it says Jesus looks upon him with love. Because I believe God, I know God wants us to have assurance. Why? Because he's a good father. I want Raj to have full assurance every day that when he wakes up, I love him. When he goes to sleep, I love him. That no matter what he does, I love him. And God, how much better a father is God? Salvation is not solely hinged on some prayer that I may or may not have prayed correctly. No, it's hinged on Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. My assurance isn't tied to something in the past that I said. It's not tied to some future uh, arrangement Jesus has made for me. It's tied to a present relationship. You know, the hymn Blessed Assurance nails it when it says, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Not Blessed Assurance, heaven is mine. Not Blessed Assurance, life after death is mine. No, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. And Jesus is mine, right? <laughs> There's power to mine. That speaks to a depth of relationship. That's my wife. <laughs> Raj is my son. There is a depth when you say Jesus is mine. Again, eternal life is not just measured in length. It's measured in depth. A depth of relationship, to know God and to know Jesus whom he sent. God doesn't just give tickets to heaven based on receipts we receive at some prayer at an altar. He gives Jesus Christ. And eternal life is knowing God and Jesus who he sent. We want a transactional faith. God is relational. We want to operate from a boundary that we can cross, but, but God wants to be put at the center. And that makes the last perspective on relationship with Jesus uh, pretty key. This idea of Jesus in us versus us in Jesus. Romans 6.23 doesn't say eternal life in heaven. No, it says eternal life in Christ Jesus. And tonight, I don't want to create a, a, a false choice or a dumb dichotomy as us preachers are often guilty of, especially on Twitter where we only got but so many words where it's like, it's not this, it's that, when really I'm like, well, it's both. One is just more important than the other, right? I don't want to, don't get it twisted tonight. Both of these are in Scripture. Jesus in us and us in Jesus. Paul speaks to Jesus in us five times in his letters. But you know, Paul speaks to us in Christ 165 times. Right? We should be mindful that the Bible paints a picture of both, but one is greatly overshadowing the other. But I think it's so much easier for us to think of salvation as Jesus entering our hearts because it's Jesus entering into us. Right? Jesus comes into my life. He gets a room in the house. And even just the heart, right? The heart is what one out of like 78 organs in your body, right? You just you get my heart, right? And so it becomes the subtitle of our life becomes my life tells a story and Jesus gets a part to play. And you know, you say that, 
nothing inherently wrong with that. Yeah, your life tells a story, and Jesus should play a part in it, but that's so small compared to the God of eternity <laughs> is telling a story eternally throughout all of creation, and I have a part to play in that. That is so much bigger <laughs> and so much better. In Romans 6, 23, it talks about eternal life in Christ Jesus, but I love he doesn't stop there. Paul adds, so we don't get it uh, confused, Christ Jesus, our Lord, right, our master, our king. The part Jesus plays in my story, if we're writing a story, is the author. And as the old school saying goes, he's either Lord over all or he's not Lord at all. Again, Jesus defines eternal life in John 17 as knowing God and Jesus who he sent. And this relationship isn't one where he moves into our house as a roommate. <laughs> it's not one where he uh, it becomes a branch on our tree. In John 15, Jesus makes the statement, I am the vine and you are the branches. And then nearly a dozen times over 17 verses, he gives the command, remain in me, remain in me again and again. You can't read that passage and not think, wow, you're being repetitive. <laughs> but here's two verses. Verses four and five, he says, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now of note, briefly, is, is yes, it's followed often by remain in me and I will remain in you. What that tells me is that abiding in Jesus and union with Jesus isn't to lose oneself like in Buddhism where self is an illusion and you drift into non-self. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you, Anthony. I will remain in you, David. I will remain in you, Celeste. That's still personhood. He remains in us. But also, apart from saying remain in me over and over, he says the same thing twice in these two verses because he doesn't want us to get confused. He says, apart from me, unplugged from the vine, you can do absolutely nothing. Oh, you'll be active, right? Like you'll produce things, you'll do things, you'll have leaves, you'll be green, you'll look healthy. But we were talking about fruit, eternal fruit. See, Jesus' words in, in this text, we see that fruit is essential, right? The fruit of obedience, the fruit of character. But to become overly focused on the fruit and not focused on the root is to fall into the same trap that the Pharisees did. The trap is either self-inflation Right, because I look at all the fruit in my life and I begin to look down on sinners. Right? The parable of the, the Pharisee and the tax collector looking at the tax collector praying, well, at least I'm not like that man. Or uh, uh, maybe under the surface self-hatred. Because a sober look at our own lives, we quickly realize we'll never live up to the standard. You remember, I, again, I'm not immune to any of this. I remember falling into this trap years ago, a season of of obsessing over how I was doing as a husband, as we've navigated brain surgeries, as a pastor, as we pastored a campus, as a father, as my son was receiving new diagnoses, and I'm thinking, God, how am I doing, right? What's my grade with each one of these hats I wear? Where's the, where's the fruit? Just striving until I was a hot mess. <laughs> and I, luckily, I was spending time in the Word, and I was seeing a therapist. And I remember talking to my therapist about how I was so fixated on, like, how am I doing here? How am I doing there? Like, just a hamster on a wheel, and thinking, where's the fruit? And the medicine I arrived at, I remember having this conversation with her, was John 15, where Jesus says, my job isn't to bear fruit. Right, this is the reminder in John 15. My job isn't to bear fruit. The command isn't to bear fruit. I can't do that apart from God. The command is to remain in him. My job is to stay rooted and trust God to bring the fruit. Focus on staying rooted in God because the fruit is a byproduct of that. And the cool part, if the worship team could come up as we close, the cool part is I, is I left that meeting with that therapist, and I drove right to the Catholic church. I used, before COVID, I used to go to the Catholic church all the time, praying their, praying their uh, chapel, because it's always open. <laughs> and uh, I remember I, op I opened the book of common prayer to just find that day. You know, what's the scripture for today? And it was that verse, right? Remain in me, and you will bear much fruit. It was like divine confirmation for that season I was in. And you might say, well, that's a pretty picture, pretty lofty, and feels entirely detached from reality. What does that mean for me, right? How do I apply this to my life this week? But when we apply this practically, it can be a game changer. Because so often in life, we have to, we think we have to bear fruit for a God that's out there somewhere. We're trying to bear fruit like as an offering to present to this God that's off there somewhere to like maintain relationship, maintain his, his good, our good standing with him. But we can't in our own strength. 
Again, we can't bear fruit in our own strength. Eventually, we'll burn out and tap out. I can't will myself to bear fruit if I'm detached from the vine. It's why we see a life lived in Christ is a game changer. Because too often, I lean into trying to live for Christ. You know, you pause from time to time from the busyness of the day to try to get spiritual, right? <laughs> from the, the tasks and, the, and the, the things to do. And I know I'm not alone in this. I might be describing it poorly, but I mean, if we're honest, day to day, sometimes our, our responsibilities feel like the very obstacles keeping us from a spiritual life. Like I'd be out, right, ministering to the homeless. I'd be in hospitals praying for people. I'd be one of those folks memorizing chapters of scripture and, and, and doing all these amazing things if I didn't have kids to take care of, a, a nine to five and, you know, soccer games to get to and groceries to purchase. But these are the very places that Jesus wants to meet us in. You might think I'd do more things for Christ if it weren't for all these things over here, but when you do things in Christ, well, when you parent, you're doing it in Christ. When you work that nine to five, you're doing it in Christ. When you face turmoil and suffering and strife, you do it in Christ. Even your wins, when you celebrate, you do it in Christ. If you want to dive deeper into that, just side note, a great book, A Liturgy of the Ordinary, I think is what it's called by Tish Warren. Just diving into like the mundane, God wants to meet us in it. But to close, eternal life defined, marked by relationship with Jesus isn't about entering the gates of heaven someday or something we experience after we die. It's about allowing Jesus' eternal life to saturate our lives bit by bit, day by day, task by task, remaining in Christ, abiding in the vine, not moving impulsively into the next thing on our day plan or calendar, but knowing Jesus meets us there in it. You see, again, as humans, as we open, right, our minds are like this ceaseless flow of awareness. May there be moments this week where we're awakened like Jacob was, as I said earlier, to where you might feel like you're in the middle of nowhere, you might feel like you're in the midst of the mundane, but you would say, man, God is here, and I didn't even realize it. May we live mindful of the fact of Easter isn't just that Jesus defeated death, but it opened the door to relationship with him right here in our todays. And may we realize that, that living in Christ, those over 150 times that Paul says that, should mean for us that God is telling a story and we have a part to play. Not just in heaven, because we don't have to wait for some destination, but Jesus came here. I referenced it earlier, but I want to read it. Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 23, as we step into worship. It says, a call to persevere. And the author writes, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Jesus, we thank you for the, the reality of your resurrection. God, we, we continue to celebrate it. It's not just something we want to celebrate on Easter. We can celebrate it daily. And that reality is that you removed any veil, any hindrance from relationship with you here in this life. So God, as Hebrews 10 encourages us, we press in tonight. We're going to close in worship. But God, I pray, God, that for those of us that need to, to come and taste your living water, as again, Jesus cries out in John 7, God, I pray that we would hear that call. God, where we're thirsty, where we need hope, where we need encouragement, where we need healing, God, where we need peace, wherever that may be, God, we, we step into your presence again. Maybe we held back in the first set, but God, tonight I pray you would open our eyes to the fact that you see us, you see everything we've done, and you care. You know every need, and you care. You know every detail, and you care. You don't just care, you love us. You sent Jesus to die for us so that we can meet with you in this moment. So we don't take that for granted. As we close in worship, we praise you and we pursue you in Jesus' name. Amen. Say
Not just when I'm in the four walls of the church, but at work. Jesus be when I'm at my home, when I'm at school, life. may you be the center of my life from beginning. From beginning to the end, always be, always be, it's always been about Jesus, always Jesus. Jesus, we do ask that you would be the center. God, help us to live from a centered set where you're that well. You're that living well that Jeremiah speaks to. Where, where Jesus, you said, come and drink the living water. And we know that he was standing up in front of a giant festival, giant crowd of people. They were probably believers and non-believers. They were religious leaders and tax collectors, all kinds of people in this crowd. And the invitation was for everybody. He didn't say, oh, unless you're this over here, that over here. No, the invitation was to the entire crowd, come and drink. And I don't know if you've come to drink at church before and there's been walls put up, fences put up, no, 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 like the Pharisees. <laughs> you got to do this first, that first. No, God wants to minister to you where you are. Jesus came to where we were <laughs> to minister to us. So <laughs> are you hurting? Come and drink. Do you need peace? Come and drink. Do you need healing in a relationship? Come and drink. You struggling with sin over here? Come and drink. Come and drink. We're going to have this time of prayer. The Jordan's going to be up here to pray. I'll be up here to pray. But for everybody else, maybe you say, no, I'm good. I hope we remember the second half of, of what Jesus says. Because then once you come and drink, rivers of living water, the Holy Spirit will flow from your life. And when we step out of here to be the church in those workplaces, those schools, our neighborhoods, I pray that we will be a people where living water, God's presence flows from our lives. You know, I love in Psalm 23 where it says, goodness and mercy will follow us because it's like, it's, it's almost like hunting us down, the goodness and mercy. But I like to think of it, too, is, as when I leave a place, goodness and mercy is going to be there because rivers of living water are flowing from my life. Goodness and mercy will be where I leave because God has been able to minister there. The Holy Spirit's been there. So, God, I pray that you would fill us here tonight like vessels. Make us a vessel of your hope. Make us a vessel of, of your faith. Make us a vessel of your love. Make us a vessel of your peace so that when we leave this place, it can overflow from our worship and our lives to those that desperately need it around us. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. And if you need prayer, we got people that would love to pray for you. Otherwise, you can linger out in the, I think it's nice weather now, or we got coffee down in the cafe. We just simply say that in here, let's keep an attitude of worship and let's keep an attitude of prayer. We'll see you next week. Thanks so much for joining us online tonight. We know that one of the benefits of watching online means that you can do it at the comfort of your own home. But we also know that those comforts might be calling to you now, despite a desire to stay connected to God in this moment and to what He's begun to do in your heart during the service. If you have a minute, we invite you to stick around and take advantage of the opportunity to pray with someone on our prayer team. You can request prayer in the comments of any platform, but on the online platform, you can simply click the prayer button and a host is ready to pray with you in a private chat right here online. Whether or not you need prayer, we are so grateful that you chose to worship with us tonight. We hope to see you again next weekend right here at citylifeva.com slash livestream.